But people get high-minded and they think they, they know and they'll argue with things that are calculated. Amen. So when you want to go somewhere, you, you set your compass or you use your GPS. When you want to go on a flight, this is the big one. I think aircrafts are one of the best teachers there are. If you're in a plane and you're in the clouds or you're in the rain or you're in the fog and you can't see anything, you wouldn't know if you was going to fly into the ground at full speed or not because you can't tell by how you feel. All your feelings mean nothing. It's only the instruments that you fly by when you fly a plane. It's a different license than them little two-seaters you see that buzz around here. It takes a while to become a, that level of pilot. If you fly by only what you can see, more than likely you won't reach your destination. You have to fly by the instruments. What are the instruments? The instruments are what you, your scriptures is what you use to fly. It's like the law of gravity. If you cooperate with it, you've heard me say this before, you can fly, if you defy it, you will die. You, can't, you have to have a well-calibrated instrument to make decisions. And your level of word and how much respect you give to the word of God will have you, that you will navigate at that level. If you give it 30, 60, and 100, isn't that what Jesus said? If you're a 30% navigator and you only take God serious 30% of the time, you'll have a little bit of success, but you'll have other things in your life that you don't like. 60 or 90 or 100. The closer you get to knowing how to navigate with what he said, the better success you will have. God did not write the laws to keep you from having fun. He tried to keep you from dying. The, the, the scriptures were written so you could make good decisions and you could reach your destination, not because God wanted to control you. That's why I, I like to believe this, and I, I think we could probably if we sat down. I like to believe if you define my sentences, we could go to the Word and I could back up every thought with some form of scripture. And I differentiate when it's my opinion. You've heard me say that. Because everything I tell you, this is such a high level setting to me. This is eternity. We're, we're, we're living eternity here. And the Bible says teachers are going to give a, a very high level of accountability. I should be able to connect what I tell you to the word. And if I'm just telling you stories and I don't connect it to the word, I'm making fables and illusions. I have a responsibility and anybody else who tells anybody anything has a, le a responsibility to be able to connect what they say to the truth. Remember, whole truth and nothing but used to be in the courtroom, whole truth and nothing but the truth because the judge is going to make a big decision and he needs the whole truth and nothing but the truth to make a decision when, he, when the gavel comes down as to what's going to happen. How many people have made bad decisions because they've had bad advisors? See, you have to be connected to truth. And, and John 17 says, thy word is truth. It's, your, 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 it's you connecting your scripture to your head and heart that determines the success you have. Now, most people, I don't know how they do it, but they can do it. I used to do it when I was young, didn't know God. They want to do what they want to do, so they're an exception. And their life's a mess, but they never connect it to you. I'm thinking, I, I, I want to say, but can't you see that what's happening to you? <laughs> because you're defying the laws of God. You're getting the opposite of what the word says because you're not bringing what you want under what he said. This is so fundamental, but I'm telling you, it's, it's rarely accomplished. So it needs to be preached, right? Oh, you didn't even say, man, I'm by myself. <laughs> Please don't do that. Please don't do that. Let's turn to John 3. Let's change the subject. No, I'm just... <laughs> turn to John chapter 3, verse 10. Or 19, rather. And this is the condemnation. See, this is what will condemn you. It's not sinning. You don't go to hell for sinning. You go to hell for rejecting truth. I didn't license nobody to sin now. But 
Repentance is like the anti-venom of the devil. If you get bit by a snake and you won't put any venom or anti-venom on it, you'll die. Repentance is the anti-venom for your life. If you hold on to sin, it, it'll eventually kill you in some way, shape, or form. That's why it's so important that you stand before God in forgiveness, not angry at people, and free because a slightest bit of unforgiveness, you know, God will tolerate it for a while until he gets to it because he can't fix everything in one day. But it'll be like a spot on your body that will expand into a cancer that will kill you if it's not dealt with. You with me? It's the truth. Anyway, and this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. This is supposed to be us. Next, no, no, verse 21. This is, for everyone that does evil hates the light. Now you know why people who expose truth are the most hated people in the world. Because the devil can only work in darkness if he can keep the country and our life dark enough. He can operate. But when light comes, his deeds are exposed. It turns into the most hateful thing you've ever seen. You ever seen somebody get cornered who was trying to hide their wickedness? Okay. Neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be removed. Now, this is how we're supposed to do it. But he that does truth. You notice it said truth, not perfect. It didn't say he did everything right. It just said he that does truth comes to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. A person who wants to be honest lays out their actions before their, whoever their accountability is and says, look at this and tell me what you think. Most people are afraid to do that so they stay bound in darkness because they never brought their deeds to the light to be examined so they can get out of where they are. So they just, because they're either proud or embarrassed or whatever their reason is, I don't know, there's probably a lot of reasons. They don't tell anybody anything. And I, have, I just don't think you can get by in this life without bringing it to the light. Whatever you hold in the dark, the devil is going to play in there. Amen. Now, this doesn't mean call your neighbor and all that. That's, they'll call your girlfriends and tell them. And they, they don't have spiritual authority that spiritual leadership has. It's, why would you go to somebody who has the same problem you have? and expect a different result. A lateral movement. See, all the lateral stuff isn't submission. Submission is from the top down, right? So, amen, I'll say it. <laughs> there has to be a vertical. You can't get delivered from a demon, usually horizontally. That's, that's what... You, you know, he said that's how it works, right? If you could deliver yourself, you wouldn't need a pastor. We should all go home, watch TV, and do something else. But you need a spiritual authority in your life. Now, I didn't write this either. Okay? This is not me. This, is not, this isn't Joe. This is the scripture. You have to have somebody greater than you in your life. It's just necessary. I need somebody greater than me in my life. I get scared when I feel like I'm with too many equals. Because equals massage each other and make each other feel good. I need somebody that goads me to truth and pokes me like a poker to push me up instead of let me be satisfied comparing myself to my friends. Friends are okay, but they're not for your growth usually. Some of them can be, but as a rule. Anyway. Uh, you have to have reference points to do life's journey. You know, I, like, I happen to like lighthouses. You know, if I go to the beach, I like to see those lighthouses. Now, you think about it. Before there was GPS, they had to have lighthouses to keep from wrecking those ships. Everybody needs reference points. And the Bible says if you... If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If you have a portable set of landmarks, I call it, when you want to do what you want to do and you open your briefcase and you like to change the rules so you can get your way and so you, you put yours everywhere you like them and when you're done, you put them all in your suitcase and move on, you're in peril. 
landmark, the foundations of the world were made by God. Period. We don't put our own landmarks. We cooperate with the ones that are already there. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So our reference point for life is Scripture. Always, every time, consistently, whether we like it or not. We're, I don't know, you know, we operate so far below who God is, to challenge Him is almost an insult, you know what I mean? I mean, He, he made the heavens and everything, and He, he knows how to build. Our, our life really should be one of submission and learning instead of trying to prove that we're right. Most people, when you pastor them, if they don't want pastored, they run away, stay away from you, and try to do good and have success so they can show you they were right, and they stay there for years. Be an honest in the morning. This is an honest morning here. Then they get all beat up, and then their pride gets involved, and they don't want to come back again because they're all beat up. And they're still trying to prove that they're right because they have insecurities and all that from their childhood or whatever. That's another teaching. Most of it, I think, is orphaned. Being orphaned, not being taken care of, produces what I just told you. So they live in a place where there's no success rather than repent. You have to, you have to be able to repent. And who are you going to repent to? Your friends? If you've wronged your friends, you do. But if it's not your friends you wronged, you have to repent to, to something else, right? Somebody else. So your nav navigational skills come from your ability of, to, to acknowledge the Word of God. Now, I used this last night when I was preaching up River's Edge. I, I personally think fear, like you can know the Scriptures, okay? This is just one de little deliverance talk here. You can know the scriptures, but fear won't let you obey them because you obey fear instead of the word. Turn to Luke 19. Fear might be the biggest enemy you'll ever have. You know how many people have not gotten along because they were both afraid of each other. And then they just, or everybody's paranoid and then they're all trying to outthink what the other one's going to do. So, you know, it just gets to be a mess. Luke 19, 24. And he said unto him that stood by, Take from him the pound and give it to him that has ten pounds. Okay. This guy was afraid. He was afraid. So he didn't do anything with what God gave him. And so what he had was taken away because he feared and his fear made his decision. I have a question. Would you commit resources into somebody who was motivated by fear and expect to have success? If somebody's afraid, how can, give, Lord, give me an illustration. You understand all I have is business illustrations. I hope this don't sound bad, but I'll just give you just a plain one. You have money, you're trying to make money, and you buy a product. You're afraid to tie up 2500 in a product, so you buy an inferior product for 1600 nobody wants. So you lose money. Because you were afraid to buy the quality product that somebody could really use, so that poverty mentality kept you from making money, and you lost what you had. But if you understand and you believe in something, you would buy the higher quality product, take the risk because at least somebody somewhere is going to want it because it's good. So if you're motivated by fear, you begin to make wrong decisions. If, if, I, if I talk to this person and I become friendly with me, they're going to take advantage of me. Ooh, that's a bad one. You don't even worry about that one. You just do what you normally do and you live. They're, they're not in charge of your emotions. You just do what you do. And you let them sort it out because you're a free, free moral agent, right? You do what you do because you know what's right. And you let the consequences to God. You know, I, 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 I've said this to you before. I just, I listen to people. I told you about Dolly Parton. Remember that? I'll tell you again because there's new people in here. I learned from everybody. They asked her how she built Dollywood. She says, I did it without fear. 
I just figured it took everything she had to buy a piece of ground and put an amusement park on it and everything else, all the investors she could find too. That's a huge, how many of you got that kind of guts to, to do that? Invest millions and millions of dollars, build, slave, build roller coasters and hope you make money. She did it. They said, how did you do it? She said, I did it without fear. If she'd have been fearful, she'd have drawn back and not did it. I'm not telling you to go build an amusement park. I'm telling you, it's a principle whether you, whether you know God or not. Some of the greatest people I've met didn't know God, but they weren't fearful. They had faith, and they went out and believed in themselves. See, that's why I know you can learn from people that aren't saved, which is, I say that all the time. And don't, don't be a critical saint. Be a loving saint, and you'll be able to receive a lot from a lot of people because the, just because they're not saved don't mean they're not smart. Don't equate salvation... Uh, with smarts. Some people are saved and don't seem smart. So that's not going to work, right? <laughs> True or not? They're saved and they make the craziest decision. And you're thinking, what was that? And you thought, I can't believe saved people act like that. You got to say, yes, I do. I do believe, believe they saved people act like that. Because they need wisdom. And they, the Bible says, above all, get wisdom. And wisdom is what tells you what to do with your knowledge. That's why you study and you educate yourself, but you apply your heart to get wisdom because education is not enough. It's good, it's necessary, but wisdom tells you what to do with what you've learned. That's why some people, now they get written off, they think they're, they don't know anything, but one little guy will find out how to apply one little truth and make a million dollars while all the smart people think he's stupid, he's making money. And then they go, I can't believe he did that. I don't know how that happened. He used what he knew, even if it was just a little wee bit. Amen. That's what this guy did. In the, he said, take it from him and give it to the guy who has 10 pounds. And he'll take care of people that don't have money. God's, God's just good. He's, take, he's helped me when my life was no good. So I'm not saying, but I'm telling you, when you want an investment, you've got to find somebody who's not afraid to do things. Jesus found doers, tax collector, dishonest tax collector, but he was a doer. Fisherman, probably John was called the son of thunder. I guess he was a fighting fisherman too. Peter, he found people that were doing something and he put resources, the gospel in their hand. He says, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He invested in people who were already Producers, Because you couldn't commit. Could you imagine if he committed this to a couch potato? Really? <laughs> Paul went through shipwreck, stonings. He, you know what? He, he, he bragged on his accomplishments. You know, he says, I studied to defeat a Gamil. I'm a Roman citizen. I'm a lawyer. I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees, but I consider it all dung. But he was still a doer. Look what all he accomplished. He was a doer. And so he was, oh man, he was committed to him, the right to Gospels. Not the Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, but two, uh, almost two-thirds of the New Testament, Paul wrote. He wrote it from prison. He wrote it from bad places. He did what he was supposed to do with his resources. God gave Paul much revelation because he knew Paul would give much revelation out. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So fear paralyzes you. This guy was afraid. He said, I was afraid. If you're afraid, you, you store things instead of take. You know, when you get something, there's a risk in using it, right? Because you, you kind of use it up. It doesn't matter what it is. You kind of use things up. And if you're afraid, you hoard them. I may be going to yard sale, seen stuff in new packages that people had 25 of them, and you couldn't figure out why. It's kind of like that. <laughs> yeah, I said this to you, it's been years, I, I may have said it a year ago, I don't even know, but when I was a kid, a whole bunch of people come out of the depression, and, and depression was bad. It was bad. I, I actually don't think I'm crazy. I watch videos on a depression because I want to, I want to know how life works. I think that we, when you disconnect from too much reality, you, you fabricate this world that doesn't exist. I need to know what people went through because I need to relate, I need to connect, and I need to know it can happen again because history repeats itself. And it may repeat itself real soon. 
But I remember my father would make these statements about people. He Sometimes he talked too much, said things. He said, that guy would put a nail on the wall and hang a piece of string on it. And I thought, once you've been broke long enough and hungry, that's what you do. Because when you're afraid, you will put a nail on the wall and put a piece of string on it, thinking you might need that string later. Does anybody identify with that? If you were raised in an environment where there wasn't a lot of resources, you would know what I just said. See, poverty leaves an indelible mark on you and you become a hoarder if you don't get delivered from, from that. And I'm not defending them. I just can honestly tell you, I can see how that could happen to people. Because, you know, in a depression, if you go look at it, some people move 10, 12 times trying to feed their kids, find places they can grow food. They didn't own homes. Just to give you a little hint about the depression, if you ever want to check it out, listen to this. The farmers, the, the, there was no money to buy nothing. The food, they dumped it out. Do you know they dumped it out? How many of you know that? Farmers were dumping those big five-gallon stainless steel cans of milk on the ground because there was nowhere to sell it. They're milking the cows and dumping the food on the ground, throwing away food. There's starvation over here, but there was no way to get it over there. The system broke so bad that you couldn't move nothing around. A farmer would have, a, just say, a dollar in something, and he'd sell it for 42 cents. The more he planted, the more money he lost. Now, I don't know how all that happens to the economy, but do you realize how messed up that gets? And all that stuff went on in the Depression, and we're just so far disconnected from it. I consider it fortunate now that I was connected to people that went through it because it, it, I actually think it affected me as a child enough to make me real grateful for what I got and everything. I, it did something in me that I never forget. It's, it's, a change, it's changed how I view things all my life. Uh, that's why you should listen to some of the stories. Anyway, so we establish our own decisions that are made out of our, not made out of our feelings. You can't live by what you feel. You have to live by the truth. You know that because you'll feel one way and the truth will tell you to do something else. You cannot live by your... And most people live by their feelings. That's why it says to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. It's the decisions you make out of your spirit are the ones that will make you successful. The ones you make out of your head, they're tolerable, but they're really not connected I'm going to close with this. The word enmity. I've stuck this in a lot of sermons. Enmity means strong hatred. That's what it is in Genesis. Where he will say, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. The Bible says that the carnal mind is an enmity against God. I had to accept the fact that my mind didn't want to do what God wanted me to do. It was my enemy. Most people think so much of their own opinion, they can't put it down long enough to see what God wants. I always say the problem with humans is they think too much of themselves, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Your, your mind without God is an enemy of God. Now, I believe in educating yourself, and I think you should fill your mind. I learn all the time. I like it. But it has to be in subjection. You could, we'll just go to the extreme. Hitler's mind was not in subjection to the laws of God. But he had a mind, and look what he got done with his mind and demonic power. Nimrod's mind wasn't subjected to God, so God had them all speak different languages to destroy their work because their mind was going in the wrong direction. Just to give you a thought about your mind. Well, this is to get us back to the original pattern. That's what all this was about this morning, is to connect you to the Word. You know, I, I know that you can't be connected. You, you know, you got to follow a man because God gives people a man and he gave him Moses and etc. 
But a real man of God or a woman of God wants to betroth you to God. They're the best man, right? That's what John said. I'm the best man. I'm going to betroth you to Jesus. The goal is to make sure your people know the voice of God and the word of God for themselves so they make good decisions based out of what they know about God and his word. No pastor in his right mind would want to tell everybody what to do. He'd be a kook. Don't ever follow somebody like that. The goal is to get enough word in the people so they know what to do according to the scripture instead of what they think. That's why we set this this morning. That's what all this was about, to get you to lean toward making the scripture your decision-making information. Amen? Stand to your feet this morning. Father, we just thank you this morning. God, I thank you that we're not beating the air like Paul, Paul said he doesn't want to beat the air. That we actually get it, God, and we implement truth in our life. God, I thank you that we're not laying another foundation other than that which was laid already, and that was Christ. And we will consciously build our lives on what Jesus said so when the storm comes, God, and beats vehemently on our house, it will not fall. I thank you, Lord, that our mind is renewed to the word of God. It says be renewed in the spirit of your mind. I thank you, Lord, that our mind is renewed, that we think God's thoughts, not our own, that there's been enough word put in, Lord, that we're transforming. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind this morning in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, our minds are renewed. Day by day, we read the scriptures and we fill ourselves with the word till we have the, your view instead of our own, Lord. I thank you that our mind will be used to advance the kingdom. It'll be used to improve our life because it is subject to the word of God. I thank you, God, you're eradicating every independent thought and bringing us into a place of submission to the word of Almighty God. Thank you for loving us so much. You gave your life to us today. You took the punishment that we should have gotten. We honor you. We bless you this morning in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen and amen and amen. amen.